Hi, I'm Chris. I'm a year six teacher and I've been a geography lead for five years. I work at Menston Primary School um, and this year we managed to secure the primary geography quality mark and we got a silver award. So we'll be going for gold next time, uh, but Digimap played a part in some of the uh, aspects of what we did to get that award. So in the coming slides, I'm going to show you um, a couple of things um, that we did, what it looked like in the book and how we did it on Digimap. And I'm also going to explain the rhetoric behind it, just giving you some criteria that came from that Digimap, sorry, from that um, GA quality mark. So some criteria that say what you need to do. Um, and then I'll sort of show how we use Digimap to fulfill that criteria. It's not from the national curriculum, but it's from, um, from the, the Geographical Association. So it's high quality stuff. And obviously it's kind of beyond the national curriculum. So hopefully it's in-depth good stuff as to what we're doing and why we're doing it. So first thing we did is we, uh, in year four, we measured the River Wharf. Um, we used Digimap to do that. And uh, the reason being um, in, the, in the GA guidance, it suggests that we uh, investigate a sense of place. So as you can see on the screen there, there's two, two of the uh, pointers um, that sort of give it a really good indication of why you should be doing this sort of a thing. Uh, you investigate things at a range of scales to develop a deeper sense of place, and it builds people's understanding of what children places are like. Uh, we chose our home sort of town or near, nearby town called Ilkley, where the river walk flows through. It's the most local river, uh, and the children obviously do a, a river study in year four. And it's the skills that they apply to be able to do that. They're using a range of geographical skills, um, using Digimap as their sort of uh, children mapping uh, system. So this is what the outcome looked like in their book. Um, so the children essentially used Digimap to plot the course of the River Wharf. And um, we looked at a range of different maps first, um, looking at some aerial maps. Um, I think there might be a map on there, which is from a, a, another, another mapping system, maybe Google Maps, just to kind of give an overview of the relief. But the children could compare it. Then we've got the Digimap aerial and um, OS view. Um, then the children plotted the course using the distance measurement tool in Digimap, and they made comments about it using geographical vocabulary along the way, including um, confluence and tributaries, um, where the river wall flows into the river ooze and then goes out to an estuary of the sea. Um, so overall, that's kind of the outcome in the books. And here's how we did it uh, using Digimap, essentially using the uh, measurement tool. So I'll try now moving to Digimap. Uh, can you still see that, Denise? Is, is it now on Digimap on a map of England? Just a second. I was replying to the email. Yes, I can see that now. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to hit into the search bar uh, Ilkley and hit enter because that's our nearby town. And I'm going to select Ilkley Bradford and that takes us to our location straight away. Now that I'm in there, I can use the map selector and I can swap between uh, an ordnance survey and an aerial map. So at the moment, I'm on the survey. I've selected aerial here. And if I slide between the two, it goes between um, the aerial view and the ordnance survey. Now, there are different reasons why you might want to use either the ordnance survey or the aerial map. But for the purposes of this, actually, the River Wharf appears nice and clear um, on the aerial view map. Um, so I'm going to use that for now, just because it's really clear where the, where the River Wharf is. Now, we can do this in different scales. We could zoom out. Um, and we could um, follow the River Wharf all the way back to the source, way up in the Dales. Um, and we could go all the way to the ocean, uh, see where it meets the River Ouse near York, and then goes out onto the Humber Estuary. Uh, and that would be quite a, a lengthy task. So what we chose to do with our year four children is just sort of select two local villages and say, let's measure the, the distance of the River Wharf between those two villages. So this is Ilkley, and our, our town uh, of Menston is just above it here on the hill. So um, we sort of said, let's do it between maybe Addingham and uh, through to Burley. Uh, and that meant that we could kind of get a set, a set area and look at the length of the River Wharf. So to do that, really simple, um, we go into the measurement tools um, and we click distance. And once we click distance, um, you literally just click on with your mouse and you can start plotting points by clicking and dragging and moving along the, the River Wharf. So I did say I was going to go from adding in, so I'll, I'll restart that. Um, the reason I want to have another go is to show you that if you click and drag, click and drag, you can plot a, a point and you can sort of go in straight lines as to wherever you like um, and double click to end your distance. 
to delete the measurements that you've made a mistake on or you don't want, you can just hit the delete measurements, delete all. Um, but this cool thing, which is really, really suited to um, following the course of the river, um, if you click um, whilst pressing shift, you can actually just hold your mouse button down and drag. Um, so if I'm, I'm holding shift now, I'm clicking and I'm holding my mouse button, and this way I can just trace the path of the river walk with my cursor. Uh, and as I do that now, I can get a really good indication without clicking 500 times to get the, uh, the length of the river walk. So along we went, and that's us measuring the river walk. Now our year four teachers were a bit nervous about doing this before they saw it. Once we showed them how easy it was, they were really, really positive and they were like, yep, we can do that. Our kids can do that. There's all sorts of extensions you can do. Um, you can go further if you want. You can make predictions. Uh, you can see how it changes from the distance following the actual river to if you were to take a straight line point and go from start to finish. So we've got 11.7 kilometers there. If we do it following the course of the river, we've got um, 9.4 kilometers if we do it um, by measuring in a straight line. Um, so it just gives you that sort of uh, idea of how far it is from one place to another and how far, oops, oops. there we go, how far it is from one place to another as the crow flies and then how far it is um, on the river walk. And as I say, from that, we then popped all these, these bits into our books, looking at the, the, the different language and vocabulary for measuring the river walk. So that was one real simple one. Um, another one um, is in year six, um, we used overlays in Digimap, uh, and that allowed us to look at biomes and population density. So again, looking at the rhetoric, it's giving children the op opportunity, repeated opportunities to collect, observe, and measure, record geographical information in a variety of ways through using maps. So we use Digimap to help us look at world maps and then look at uh, different overlays um, in relation to the topics that we're looking at. So the way that we did that, this is what it looked like in the classroom. Um, and the thing that I really liked about this particular activity when we were doing population is we had three different maps going on. We had um, a map from um, one of the schemes that we were using to show the population density um, of different countries. And that's the, the, that's the map, I don't think you see my cursor, but that's the map here that's printed out. And each country was just given a color based on its population density. We then related that to a world atlas so that they could look at the names of the countries against the population. But then we use Digimap overlays, and this gives you a much more specific picture of where the population density is. So for example, you can probably barely see it, but I'm sure you all know China and India have got very high population densities. So they're going to appear all one color on this map down here. But in Digimap, it shows where the people in the country are. So not all of India has got super high population density. Not all of China has got super high population density. It's just specific areas in the cities. So this is what it looked like in the classroom where the children are comparing three different maps. And this is how they recorded their results. We ended up drawing a graph. We looked at population over time and saw how the population had changed between 1500 and uh, 1950. And then the children then made comments they found different uh, locations with uh, low, medium, and high population density, and then they comments on it based on some of the questions we put um, up on the board for them. And this is what it looked like in Digimap and how we did it. So again, I'll go back to Digimap. I will refresh my page, which should get rid of all those bits. And go back to the UK. So I'm going to scroll out all the way for this one so you've got more of the world map on. And this one's real simple, you hit overlays. And for this one, it was world human geography. So for world human geography, we click at the population density, um, and then instantly we get the population density in specific places. And so then we used a version of this map here, children looking at it, and they could see really specifically where the different um, uh, highly populated areas are. And we've got the key down the side there. You can change the transparency on it to make it more uh, prevalent and then go back to see what countries um, uh, we're looking at. And then we took this map and we compared that map, if I go back to this presentation. We compared that map there. These are the two maps I was talking about before. So India over here, we see the high population density all over. But when we look at this map, we can see that there are areas with less population density. And we can kind of talk about why that might be, uh, what, what physical features might be there, whether it's the mountains, whether it's really hot, if there's a, a desert area. And we can see where the cities are, the, the, the largely populated areas. Same then for, for Europe. 
But what we did, which was really interesting, is look at a satellite um, picture from uh, space of the Earth at night. And then the children were able to kind of compare a digimap where the high population densities are with a picture taken from space at night. And obviously those um, areas that show up very brightly on the map, that's where all the streetlights are and all the cities are. And that really closely correlates with what you see on the high population densities. So it's just looking at a variety of different maps and looking at how population density can be represented. Um, we also did it for biomes. Um, in year six, we do biomes. There's a bunch of different things uh, and overlays that people um, can use throughout school. Um, and the way that we chose to do that with our work on biomes is we go back to our um, overlays. And this time we look at um, world physical geography. Um, and we can do biomes, just click it up. Um, and we, we were able to compare all the different types of biomes. I won't go into detail on this one. Um, I'll just explain that we used it. And um, for our year fours, uh, they did mountain ranges. So they use all the uh, significant mountain ranges in the world. For our year fives, we looked at volcanoes around the earth. And now, it, this is new actually. Um, it's really cool, I was looking this afternoon. We've now got not only tectonic plates, um, there are, um, tectonic plate boundaries, and then when you put that up with the volcanoes, it's really easy to see your Pacific Ring of Fire, you see this when it loads up. Yeah, it's glitching a little bit. Okay, so if we head this way, we can see our Pacific Ring of Fire starting to appear here. Um, so I found it really useful for a bunch of different uh, year groups, um, ir irrelevant of sort of um, what, what it is that you're studying. There's usually a um, an overlay that you can use in, in your year group. Um, um, our year fours, we're using uh, population density, uh, we're using some of the climate stuff, looking at precipitation, and that helps them to look at the um, mountain ranges and see how precipitation alters because of um, the, the Himalaya and how they'll create a rain shadow on the high Tibetan foot, foothills. Click on all these. We can go back onto uh, precipitation between 2010 and 2018 and we can see that we've got a rain shadow up here and um, because of the Himalaya and the children were able to talk about that in their year four geography lesson so the overlays I found really really useful for, for key stage two in particular uh, there's always something there for, to meet an international curriculum so that was the uh, the, the overlays uh, the next thing that we did um, or have done is uh, inserting photographs onto a map now I'm going to show you how to how to do this. Um, I've done it in a number of different ways. Um, we've used it right down from key stage one, where teachers prepare this map in advance and take photographs, insert them onto a map of school. Um, I've done it where in year five I turned it into a history, um, almost like a scavenger hunt type thing. Put out lots of um, artifacts, and pupils had to go around school with an iPad, take pictures of the artifacts, and then insert them into the map and plot where they were on a map of school. Uh, and I'm going to show you today a wider area, something that you might be able to do if you're on a field trip, just take pictures and insert them into a um, into a map of a wider area. So again, the reason, the rhetoric behind this, the GA talk about field work being really important, uh, regular geography field work, using the school grounds, local and wider area to enable pupils to develop a better understanding of space. Um, also the relevance of it, um, obviously with it being your school, it's very relevant and specific to the children. It gives them a real world view of what's around them um, or in any, of your, in any of your field trips that you're going on. It gives them an opportunity to um, sort of use the mapping skills on their field trips as well. Rather than just looking at a map prior to going, they can sort of take the pictures and then come back to the class and insert them on the map. Or if you've got internet access while you're on a residential, you can take the pictures and then when you get back and you've got your internet access, you can upload those pictures to a map. So um, again, I'll show you what that looked like in Digimap. So as an activity in Digimap, if you reset the page, there we go. And I'm going to look at a local place uh, called Malham, which is a, a beautiful part of the Yorkshire Dales. I'm not sure where everyone's from in and around here. You, you may have heard of it or even been. But if I search for Malham, but not on North Yorkshire, it takes us in there and we've got an open survey map of it. Now, if you're planning a route to walk, you might look in advance at the map, or again, like I say, you could take pictures and then come back to the classroom and insert those pictures into this map um, afterwards. 
So the way that we do that, we hit the Join Tools. But actually, it's interesting because there's a camera down here, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But to insert your own pictures, you have to go into Drawing Tools, and there's a little button here that says Upload Image at Selected Position. Once you've got the uh, the Drawing Tools open, you hit the little camera, and then on my map, um, select a point, and I'm going to go Malon Cove here. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit and get to Malon Cove so I can get specifically to the contour lines that I want. And I'm going to pick my point here and click. Now, I've already taken these pictures from the internet, downloaded them and put them into a folder on my computer. You can do it from an iPad as well, and it's really easy to do. Um, you can hit Choose File, and preloaded, so hopefully we should come straight up. Hit Malum Co for my image. Open and upload. And now I've got a picture of Malum Co and a little pointer showing um, you know, whereabouts on the map that is. So if I zoom back out again, and do another one over at Gravel Sky. Gravel Sky, here we go. So if again, if I zoom in and find uh, find Gordo Scar and the waterfall at Gordo Scar, I can just pop in, click on the uh, image, click on the point where I've taken the photograph, choose the file, and I can pop in my picture of Gordo Scar. And then I've got a reference of pictures associated with the location that I've been in. Finally, I've got one more from Alan Town, and that was around about here. So we zoom in here. Again, you go to the image, click on the area where the picture was taken, select the file, and click Malum. Close to view the picture off. So now I've got a reference of the what I've seen on the walks that we went on in our residential. Um, and it's a good way of the children being able to um, look at places on, a, on an urban survey map or even an area map if you choose. Now, I did this uh, activity once around school, like I say, with a history activity. And I did it with um, iPads and everything was set up perfectly. We had Wi Fi all around the site. We had iPads that children could access with Digimap. I even had a little Google uh, document so they could write things in there as well. They could take the pictures on the iPad, upload it. The one thing that I found is Digimap does allow you on an iPad to add the picture and take the picture right there and then. Um, and you can just upload it immediately onto the map through Digimap. But the problem I found is if your connectivity went down or if uh, there was a glitch at all, you'd lose all the pictures and you'd have no work left to save. Um, and the kids found that really frustrating if and when it happened to them. So what I learned was if you're going to do that with an iPad, um, take out the iPad, take the photographs on the iPad and just do them in the camera roll and then go into Digimap separately and upload them from your camera roll. That way, if Digimap has a glitch or something goes wrong, you lose connectivity or your Wi-Fi goes down or you stray too far um, and you lose the pictures, actually, you've still got the photographs saved on your iPad and you can upload them really quickly again. Uh, it's quite quick and easy to do once you know where they've been and what you've taken. But if you just did it directly through Digimap and your Wi-Fi went down or something happened and there's a glitch, um, the pictures aren't actually stored anywhere um, and you just lose all the images and you lose all your work because that's retake them all. So that was just a little tip that I found when I was doing it on the iPad. Um, take the pictures on your camera roll and then upload them to Digimap afterwards. Um, so let me put it back. I'll just hit refresh. Reload. And there's just one last thing um, that we've used at, at our school that's been helpful. Uh, and there's no real rhetoric from this other one other than sort of supporting staff in terms of helping them to understand Digimap and how they can use it. Lots of, lots of people wanted to save maps that they'd either created or used. Um, the teachers might have made a map and they want to save it for sure for children, or the children might have completed their maps, put all their pictures in, and then they want to save that map for future reference so they can look at it in another lesson. So um, to, to be able to do that, there is a save map um, option. So this way you get to have a cheeky little look at some of the maps that our, our um, teachers have made at our school. And uh, it's just a case of like looking at the function and how you save those maps. So we'll go back to Digimap now. I realise I shouldn't have deleted that map. I should have left it in. Um, let me do another quick map. Here. Let's put Condor Oak in. Okay. If I just do a really quick uh, measurement of the river walk again. 
Actually, I'll do an area. Actually, I'll do an area of a triangle. Get the other cross. So there's my area results for you. Um, if I want to save this map for future reference, I can just head on into our saved maps. And in here, you can create a folder structure. Um, and I've, I've created um, a folder structure for all of our different classes so that they can save their maps into those folders. So if I go into to my folder logic so I can pop it in the year six one, um, and I can hit save map. Um, give the map title, area of Ilkley, class name, Sycamore, pupil name, Musco Davison, and hit save on that. And now I've got my um, map saved in there. So if I um, log out of Digimap, come back in another in another lesson, and I want to revisit any of that work, I can go into saved maps, I can go down my folders, my folder structure, and I can find my year six one, and I can pull up my map uh, of the area. Oh, he says, oh, he says, but it's not there. Maybe I did it too quick. Because if we look at another map that I've done here, we did one of the exercises around school and we put all our pictures in. Just technology to do that to you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, fine. But I promise you it did work when I did it before. I think I maybe saved it too quick without giving it a chance to, to um, save the area. But it does save the drawings and the pictures in there for you. So this is one that we did when we were doing some staff training. The staff went around and they took pictures of the school building and every building that they went to, they put a, took a photograph and put the point in. So um, despite the fact that my map wasn't saved then, apologies, here's some of the other things that other people have been getting up to. Um, in reception, they simply had a walk around school and they dropped a little marker to say where they'd been. Um, year four, um, they wandered around school. I think they did this activity after we did the staff training uh, and they took pictures of the different school uh, classes within school and dropped them in the right location. Um, year three. Let's see. That was in the saved maps as well. Uh, Robin Hood's Bay. This was it. This was in key stage one. It was just they wanted to get to Robin Hood's Bay really quickly. So they literally just screen grabbed the, uh, the, the, the location of Robin Hood's Bay. Um, a labelled map of Whitby. I think this was done in key stage one again, just using the vocabulary of coasts. So they got the map up on the screen and then inserted the vocabulary um, just to kind of show um, the types of uh, landform that you'd find uh, human and physical geography at the coast. Um, and as I say, it's just other people within school who've, who've then saved their maps to, to be able to bring in. So you can have it in the saved maps, you can create folders just to store all the maps. So um, I've probably spoke far too fast. There's a lot of stuff in there, but if anyone's got any questions about any of those specific things, then let me know and I'll try try go through it again. But hopefully that was helpful to see some of the things we've been doing at Wednesday. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm John. Um, I'm a year six teacher in the West Midlands and uh, I'm geography lead. And um, yeah, I'm going to talk about, so I'm, Basically, I planned out geography for everybody in our junior school. And um, I asked uh, year five to do some um, things with Digimap. And uh, I went and observed them. And I just wanted to share what they'd done because I thought it was really good, really engaging for the kids. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to share that. Um, so this was in the topic of coasts. So if I, uh, I'll just share my screen. Okay, so back the first one. So they were doing um, coasts. The first one was just to um, investigate coastal erosion. Um, they did, the children did this at the end of the unit. I think really probably more engaging if they would have done it at the start just to get the curiosity. But the teacher got them to, um, they'd already talked about what coastal erosion was and what countries do to stop coastal erosion, that kind of thing. And um, we wanted them just to use Digimap to investigate um, rates of coastal erosion in the UK. So the end the end was looking something like um, like this here. Um, actually, I'll just show you. I'll just show you on Digimap how they did it. So we went to the children went to um, with um, C. Um, yeah, so it was around here. 
we got them to start. Um, and yeah, around here. So we got okay, so we went with the uh, 1890s map and the uh, current map. So we got them to using the drawing tools, we got them to um, uh, so line uh, freehand. So if in purple, so on the current map, if I do where the uh, the edge of the beach is basically, so the edge of the beach and the children uh, went down like that, and then we um, we moved it over to the 18, 1890s. Same again. So we choose a, a different color uh, line. Uh, so it's an orange. So if we look where the edge of the beach was in the 1890s. OK, so we can. Uh, yeah, so we can compare them. Um, so straight away, children are seeing. So the I mean, they can use the text box as well. So if I go into. Uh, yeah. Text box. Um, so yeah, click on text box. So let's oh, change to yellow. Um, but so they put in something like where where beach meets sorry, where um beach ends now. Uh and then they can just um move that around so it's that one i think isn't it uh that's it where beach ends now and then they can label that one text box um where beach ends 1890s uh, make that a bit smaller and then um, move it around Okay, so when they move between the two, imagine the, um, yeah, imagine, I mean, imagine the learning from children from 10 year olds when they see um, on the current map where the beach ended in the 1890s. Now that would have been in the sea. Um, and then using the measuring tools, so distance, um, Okay, and then, so how much land has been lost since the 1890s and now? Uh, this one, wasn't it? Yeah, so uh, 100 and, oh, 100 and set, 131 metres, uh, go somewhere else, you know, 200 metres. Yeah, so basically, um, yeah, I thought this was fantastic. Um, you know, they can investigate different parts of the UK um, is the is the East Coast worse than the West Coast of the UK and I think this year we'll do that at the start of the unit just to really get their um, just to really get their curiosity you know how much land is being lost I think this is really effective you know you go to some parts and where the beach ended in the 1890s is now you know under the sea um, so I thought that was really good so I wanted to share that one um, something else they did was um, comparing different types of coastal coastal town when they were doing um, coasts. So if I come out of this one, um, so when I when I observed them, they were comparing um, Newquay in Cornwall. Uh, and um, it was just using just using the buffering tool, really nice and simple. Uh, so buffer, and I think we went for about um, three kilometer radius. I think they went for um, um, so kilometers uh, um, three. Okay, and then uh, in purple color. Um, so what they then did with Newkey, um, yeah, they just went in and looked at all the features that they're in Newkey. So um, took some screenshots. So we had things like uh, here. So we had children, you know, campsite, amusement park, holiday park, that kind of thing. And then they did the same thing in 
a different kind of coastal town, Southampton, so a lot more commercial. You got the dock, an incinerator, a power station, industrial park, that kind of thing. So it was just co uh, comparing different types of coastal town. And um, another one I saw in year five, this was, um, this was, uh, I mean, you could also use this for how land use has changed, couldn't you? You could, you know, you could go into the old maps and see uh, how that land use has changed. This was in, um, they're actually stood in the UK when I saw this, but you could do this for a coastal town where they were um, comparing land use change. And I got them to use Milton Keynes as an example. Um, so if I reset that, So Milton Keynes. The reason I got them to do Milton Keynes was because it's really hard to see how the West Midlands has changed because, because the West Midlands, it's such a massive conurbation. It's You can look at Milton Keynes and it's a nice, obviously it's, you know, it's surrounded by countryside, so it's quite easy to highlight. So uh, what did they do? They, um, I think they used the drawing tools. Yeah, and I think they went round, yeah, just round, went round Milton Keynes uh, like this. And then it was, I've had a look, I can't remember how they did this actually, but there was a way you can just um, purple it um alternatively you could just use the uh the buffering tool again couldn't you but basically they um yeah so they did that um you need to go a bit closer i think to use the other the other ones um so if i use the buffering tool instead um kilometers three Actually, we need to be a bit less. If I just go for one kilometer, let's go a bit bigger. Um, so if I went for three kilometers, um, the only thing I can't remember how the teacher did was getting this thing to, oh no, it works now, it is keeping still. Yeah, so we've got Milton Keynes now, so children can go in, you know, pick out features now, and then they can go into the, the older maps and see how that land use has changed using the text boxes. So the outcome was something like um, something like this. So um, here, so this is on the 1890s map here, now a big roundabout. Um, you know, they can go with the 1950s one as well. 1950s, a farm, now a building. 1890s, nothing here, now it's buildings, that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, all about land use, UK land use changes. Okay, so not... Um, yeah, so just some basic things, really, I thought were really great. The learning was really great, you know, especially that one about coastal erosion. Um, yeah, high levels of engagement, yeah. So uh, just sharing a few things that I'd seen uh, in year five that I thought were really great. That's it.